Good morning, everyone. Uh, do we have a here? This is what we need. Welcome to the session, Lunar Science in the Wake of Human Exploration, Four Decades of Samples and Surface Data, uh, One. Uh, this is a, a very uh, special occasion. Many of you in here will know, some will not know, that tomorrow is the 40th anniversary of the Apollo 17 launch. So we have a session here where we will begin with that base and move forward through time as we have looked at Apollo data, Apollo samples, and then through uh, additional missions and up to the present day where we have LRO and indeed GRAIL uh, uh, results coming in and how we're integrating those uh, and using those. My name is Brad Jolliff. I'm from Washington University. My co-conveners here are Dr. Noah Petro and Dr. Rich Vondrak from Goddard Space Flight Center. And uh, it's indeed uh, a pleasure to welcome you. Just want to remind speakers and, and folks, hold on to your seats. We're going to have some lightning fast talks in some cases here. Uh, speakers, we will try to keep you on track. Hopefully, you have noted the length of your uh, talks. Well, it's indeed uh, my pleasure, and I can't think of a better way to kick off this session than to introduce to you Dr. Harrison H. Schmidt, geologist who last walked on the moon at uh, the Apollo 17 site. I don't have time for a long introduction. Let me uh, suffice it to say, Apollo 17 astronaut, superb field geologist, and still a lunatic. And I mean that in the very best sense of the word. So without any further ado, Jack Schmidt and his topic, Apollo Field Geology, 40 Years of Digesting Rocks, Field Data, and Future Objectives. Thanks, Brad. Well, thank you very much, and welcome, everybody, to uh, what I'm sure will be another uh, outstanding session once I get off the podium here. The uh, uh, first thing I wanted to uh, take care of was uh, a question I've been asked by several of you. Have we seen the bear recently? As you may recall, last year we had seen the bear. Well, we have. This is the bear. Uh, we ha our wildlife camera is picking up all sorts of things like a beautiful eight-point mule, mule deer. Actually, it got one of a ten-pointer, but uh, it's not quite as good as that one. And then the little guys that are coming along. Uh, I did want to begin today with, uh, again, as I did at the uh, league meeting, a uh, tribute to Neil Armstrong, who really was our first uh, lunar field geologist. And you, I'm not, uh, you recall, uh, uh, since we now have LRO photography, uh, uh, the landing site for Apollo 11, uh, geologically speaking, almost certainly on an uh, array of material out of West Crater. And fortunately, uh, uh, that uh, provided us with a, an extraordinary suite of uh, basalt samples that Neil collected uh, uh, and also uh, with a, uh, a variety of other material. The most important to some of us uh, may have been uh, the uh, soil sample from Apollo 11 that Neil filled the rock box with, having uh, expressed to me that he thought the box looked a little empty until he filled it up with soil. Fortunately, what is that, 10084? Uh, is, uh, is, is really a remarkable sample of the, of the regolith and, uh, and of its resources. Uh, I have, uh, uh, I'm going to go, uh, you've seen most of this and I'm not going to spend a lot of time since I don't have a lot of time, but just to illustrate just by the number of items on this uh, chart, what uh, the samples and the other work that uh, Neil did has pro have provided us. Uh, you know, do this in the context of, of thinking, uh, what if we had no other missions? Uh, and, and as a matter of fact, we used that idea when we actually put together the experiments that went to, uh, to uh, the uh, moon with Apollo 11, because the ALSEP was just not going to go. It was uh, too heavy uh, for the time. Uh, it meant three seconds of hover time if we uh, uh, the th 300 pounds would have meant that much. And so we came up very quickly with uh, the, a, seis a seismometer and a, lay and, a and a corner reflector as the two experiments that Neil deployed. Uh, that was done in consultation between uh, me and uh, Frank Press and Gene Simmons and a few of the old timers of the time, uh, geophysics, with that question in mind, if you never got back to the moon, what two geophysical experiments would you like to have? And unanimously, uh, 
the recommendations came back, those two. So that's why we knew what we did know at the time from Apollo 11. Now, more generally, uh, the astronaut participants in what was called the field, Lunar Field Geological Experiment uh, with uh, three different principal investigators, uh, Gene Shoemaker, uh, Gordon Swan, and, uh, and uh, Bill Mulberger, uh, they provided uh, rapid reaction to unexpected findings based on their own inherent intellect, uh, the, the experience, uh, uh, that we gave them, and uh, the training that came with the mission. Uh, the diverse sample collection uh, that included cores, which would have been very difficult to get at the time any other way, uh, observations of sample context, which you find in the transcripts, and uh, the photo documentation, the stereo photo documentation of the samples and their geological context. Uh, the best use of that so far has been uh, with the professional papers by the USGS, such as Ed Wolf's et al.'s paper, and uh, uh, really uh, gave us the uh, foundation for subsequent laboratory analyses for the remote sensing ground truth that we continue to use, and, uh, and interpretive insights that mature steadily over time. Uh, also, their mechanically complex experiment deployment I say mechanically complex at the time because you look at what Curiosity is doing on Mars and you know it's doing some things. But still, there were the ALSEP uh, packages were complex, more complex than they needed to be, but nevertheless uh, were uh, deployed by humans, and it would have been quite difficult in that time to do it any other way. I, I'm, uh, Paul Spudis and I uh, had a little conversation about a week ago about this uh, whole thing of uh, about lunar meteorites. Would we have recognized them as coming from the moon without the Apollo 11 samples? And uh, that's just something I let you all think about. I put down a, uh, a list of, uh, of things that to add that you might think about, and when this is available on the internet, you might be interested in this list. Uh, if nothing else, uh, it may be a teaching tool, teaching aid, uh, a good exercise, maybe an exam question. Uh, that uh, what, what, what would, would we have learned uh, that the uh, lunar meteorites came from the moon uh, and, uh, and what could we have learned from them without the Apollo samples? Now, I, I've mentioned many times, mentioned again this morning at a press conference, that I, I think the, 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 one of the most important, if not the most important, aspects of, of our understanding of the moon is that the moon records the major impact history prior to about 3.8 billion years ago. That is something, as you all know, we just don't have available to us on Earth. It's been lost due to Earth processes in the first 800 million years or so, and prolonged, but it was a period now, we know, we did not know before, of prolonged and punctuated impact violence. Uh, continental scale, probably differentiated melt sheets, and uh, all you need to do to wonder about that a bit is uh, the dates that we're coming up with on the ancient zircons, the oldest now being 4.4 billion years, which uh, I suspect is a comparable uh, to the age of formation of the largest lunar basin that I believe occurred. Not everybody, of course, agrees with this, but that's Procolarum. Uh, and uh, some large basins like that formed on the Earth and may well, in differentiating their aqueous melt sheets, uh, produce these zircons we're now pulling out of uh, ancient rocks. Uh, also, you have to uh, pretty well imagine, if not conclude, that in the aqueous environments of the Earth that there was a clay-rich regolith, a soupy regolith, and it was in that uh, uh, environment in which life's precursors, uh, molecular precursors formed. Uh, that uh, is, uh, is something that I think we can uh, take uh, pretty much to the bank now and start to think about what it means and having now from Mars uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, um, information that the ancient rocks on Mars include a great deal of clay uh, helps to support this uh, general hypothesis. Now for planetary and asteroidal surfaces, the moon offers our baseline. Uh, the regular samples, of course, give us a detailed character of an airless body's regolith. Uh, the uh, formation processes that have to be associated with that 
some very unusual things, of course, have come out of that analysis, not the least of which is the formation of nanophase iron by micrometeorite impact. Uh, and the in-situ resources that uh, we have now found there, primarily solar wind resources, but also the resources of the moon itself as they uh, interact with the solar wind uh, at high temperature. Uh, sp specifically water. I keep trying to remind everybody that you can make water anywhere on the moon. You don't have to go to special places for it, even though the, co the trade study for the, for the cost uh, impact of, uh, of those two has not been done. Uh, the surface environment and subsur subsurface structure primarily comes from uh, experiments uh, provided by the ALSEP. Uh, the uh, robotic deployment at that time was beyond then available technologies and budgets, and so uh, it was left to the astronauts. Unfortunately, in the early days of design, uh, the uh, designers were told to, quote, give astronauts something to do. Well, they did that in, in spades. Uh, Bill Anders and I ended up at a, at a PDR at, uh, at Bendix uh, tr trying to recover from that statement. Uh, we got 56 uh, uh, Calfax fasteners uh, down to, uh, I think it was 19 Boyd bolts, two different entirely kinds of fasteners, one in compression, one in tension. Uh, but it, and it, it did make it doable. It, ALSEP was not doable as originally designed. But we did get it into the thing where, although it took most of, e of a full EVA, uh, you could get it deployed. The uh, airless surface environment in space, uh, dust, um, uh, that, by the question mark I'm referring to uh, uh, levitated dust. I'm still a bit of a skeptic on that. Micrometeors, meteors, uh, transient gases, the solar wind, of course. The lunar subsurface uh, structure, quite extensive. Uh, the apparent uh, upper lower mantle boundaries. Uh, heat flow uh, uh, cores, uh, uh, the core of the moon with the absence of a global magnetic field, uh, at least in recent times, the thickness of a, a bar mar basalt cooling unit, that's the Taurus Littro cooling unit, uh, probably about uh, uh, 1.2 kilometers thick. Uh, interesting implications if indeed the major parts of the Mare are single cooling units due to very rapid eruptions. And uh, moonquakes, with uh, information uh, from that as well as other experiments on the deep thermal environment of the moon. Uh, sample diversity does uh, now uh, and has enabled realistic debate of the, on the origin of the moon. We see a recent proliferation uh, due to uh, increasingly precise isotopic data, proliferation of ideas on the origin of the moon, hypotheses. Uh, two approximately equal bodies colliding in space. Uh, the uh, a fast spinning, a, a giant impact into a fast spinning Earth, uh, the planetary disk accretion outside the Roche limit, and uh, capture of a core orbiting uh, planetesimal. That's an old one uh, left over from Alpha and Arrhenius. Uh, any origin hypothesis, though, must explain uh, the angular momentum of the Earth Moon system, uh, and there's some ingenious ideas on how that can be explained now. Identical isotopic geochemistry relative to the Earth, the volatile retention in pyroclastic uh, volatile source regions, that is, reservoirs of volatiles in the interior of the Moon, uh, volatile depletion in the Mari source region, uh, abundances of non volatile elements in, uh, uh, throughout the Moon, as near as we can tell, uh, and uh, apparent seismic and uh, compositional boundary between the upper and lower mantle, and the size of the core. All of these things have to come into uh, origin hypotheses. Now, uh, quickly transitioning to the uh, issue of water ice and the lunar coal traps, uh, I am uh, under the impression with very limited uh, look at the uh, two neutron spectrometers that have flown that we may have uh, to work with both of them to figure out exactly what's, what uh, coal traps uh, are indeed uh, contain uh, uh, precipitated volatiles, uh, prospector versus uh, lend. Uh, but nonetheless, we have uh, three possible sources now. First of all, the comets, which has been the original idea with reprecipitation of cometary volatiles, uh, solar wind reactions with the regolith, uh, and, uh, and indigenous pyroclastic volatiles. Uh, that, that comes from the recent uh, uh, analysis of the interior of glass beads, orange and green glass beads, 
that show uh, the presence of trace amounts of water. Uh, with those uh, eruptions uh, three to three, three and a half billion years ago on the moon, uh, we, uh, we do have a, a, a water introduced into the lunar environment that may uh, have uh, migrated towards the uh, poles. Uh, lunar resources, uh, cost-effective supply in space and at space bases and settlements, uh, quite a list of uh, resources that may be important to us then. Cost-competitive use on Earth and for space propulsion and settlement power, of course, is helium-3 as a fusion fuel. Uh, living in space, we have a number of lessons learned, hardware and software, crew capability and training requirements, planetary surface operational requirements, uh, and much improved space suits needed are all things that are well understood. Uh, lessons to be learned, not so well understood, are the relative roles of humans versus robots, uh, implementation of autonomous human exploration for Mars and asteroids because of communication time delays, entry, descent, and landing on Mars. We have no idea how to do that, although there's some interesting uh, postulates on that matter. And uh, how to explore an asteroid, that's, uh, that's another big question. Uh, how do you attach yourself to a, a essentially zero-gravity body? And in situ resource utilization in space. Uh, all of these uh, lessons to be learned are something that I personally think can uh, result from putting the moon in the critical path of going to Mars, and uh, we'll see how that works out. Economic sustainability of bases and settlements uh, relates, again, to uh, the use of the resources of space. Open science questions that uh, we, I think we continue to have to look at, uh, large basin age chronology and the history of impact episodes. That relates directly to understanding the Hadean on Earth and on Mars. Uh, we can't forget that. South Pole Aiken and non, other non, and non mascon basins are particularly important in, uh, in this. Uh, the origin of the moon, uh, geochemical data from the lower mantle, where do we get that? Uh, the modeling of non-impact capture, I still say, needs to be done uh, much more rigorously than it has. Uh, mechanism for creep, con creep, uh, your creep concentration uh, under the Procolarum Basin uh, is of uh, importance with continental scale, scale basin modeling, and by that I mean basin modeling here on Earth. What, what in the world does a, a, a South Pole Aiken or Procolarum impact mean when, it's, uh, when it occurred on the Earth? What, is it, how did, what, what does a modeling of that uh, tell us? Petrogenesis of lunar volatiles. Uh, we need samples, of course, from the, uh, the polar regions. Uh, petrogenesis of magnesium sweet and granulite sweet. And, and, and uh, Brad reminded me this morning of the granites as well need to be uh, added to that list. Uh, the uh, central peaks, sculptured hills, uh, are all uh, areas, and plus the volcanic regions uh, that have been identified recently, uh, silicic volcanic regions. South Pole Aiken uh, still comes up on that list as well. Uh, the lowest concent cost concentrations of helium-3 water, et cetera, again, that's, uh, that's a, not only a data question, it's a trade study in terms of the cost of reaching these uh, areas. Uh, we have titanium-rich regolith uh, for helium-3, which uh, has shows ilmenite trapping, and we have a high-latitude regolith coal trapping. Uh, it's, it's, it's not clear which of these is going to be most important. And so after 40 years, we, uh, we leave uh, the Challenger here sitting, or part of it anyway, leave, <laughs> sitting on the lunar surface. Fortunately, the, uh, the upper half of that worked very nicely and, and uh, brought the crew back. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we had a number of challenges in there that I heard, and I think in the interest of trying to keep us close to on time, we'll move on. Please try to catch Dr. Schmidt after the session if you have a quick question, but I warn you that he'll be uh, moving quickly himself as he has to head to the airport So after a very quick lunch. So the next talk, moving right along in our session, is uh, by Saichi Nagahara, and his title is Long-Lasting Science Returns from the Apollo Heat Flow Experiments. Okay. 
Uh, good morning. Uh, Apollo 15 and Apollo 17 uh, missions deployed geothermal heat flow probes on the moon as part of the uh, Apollo lunar surface experiment package. Uh, so this picture is from uh, Apollo 17 shot by Jack. Uh, that shows you the uh, heat flow deployment site. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry, you didn't hear me? Okay. Well, so yeah, uh, so Apollo 15 and Apollo 17 deployed geothermal heat flow probes, and uh, this picture is from uh, Apollo 17, show you uh, these two heat flow probes uh, penetrated into lunar regolith down to about uh, 2.4 uh, 2 meters, and uh, those two probes were deployed 10 meters apart. Okay. Here you go. So uh, heat flow is obtained as uh, a product of two separate measurements of uh, geothermal gradient and uh, thermal conductivity. So these two graphs it summarizes the uh, uh, two set of measurements obtained at both Apollo 15 and Apollo 17 sites. So Apollo 15 sites, they were able to drill down to about 1.5 meters depth and measure temperatures at different depths, so that gave the thermal gradient. Then Apollo 17, as I told you earlier, they were able to drill down to about 2.4 meters depth and uh, able to measure the geothermal gradient at greater depth. Then for thermal conductivity, uh, the uh, instrument had a capability to measure uh, thermal conductivity in situ in the hole, but the principal investigators of the, the project, Mark Langes and his colleagues had some concerns about the, uh, the whole condition, and uh, so they ended up not using those values and then estimated thermal conductivities in a different way. And uh, so more recently also, more recent researchers have sort of uh, uh, raised some concerns about uh, the temperature measurements also. Uh, for example, uh, so this uh, it gives you the temperature, uh, temperature records of uh, Apple 15. So the, the probes were deployed for multiple years. And uh, so this graph shows you the, the temp how the temperature changed at different depths since the time of the de deployment to uh, December of 1974. Then as you can see, this uh, purple line, uh, so that's the, uh, the measurement taken at about uh, half meter depth. And as you can see, the temperature fluctuate in association with the, uh, the diurnal fluctuation of our insulation. Then you can also see uh, the seasonal change as well. And then this seasonal change goes down easily to about a meter depth. That's the red line here. Right. The, uh, if you go beyond that, you can still see this multi-year warming trend. Then, so in the last several years, there has been a debate about so what caused it. But in any case, I don't have time to get into those uh, uh, discussions. But uh, a few years ago, a panel of scientists was assembled uh, in planning for uh, International Lunar Network. And then actually quite a few of uh, people who served in the panel are sitting in the audience, I recognize. But anyway, so, uh, so when it, if there's going to be a, a future mission that will deploy a heat flow probe on the moon, the probe should reach uh, three meters depth. So uh, to avoid any sort of a concerns about surface influence. So uh, that was their recommendation. So, uh, so uh, uh, for the last 40 years, uh, so the, uh, these heat flow data sets okay, still uh, remain to be the only set of uh, in situ heat flow measurements obtained on an extraterrestrial body. So, uh, so the science community basically tries to squeeze as much juice out of these data, and uh, even now, so if you look at my uh, sort of uh, uh, statistics I kind of came up with for the, uh, the uh, number of uh, LPSC abstracts that cite the uh, original uh, heat flow measurements work, as you can see, so the number is still growing, actually. And uh, then also the, uh, the uh, heat flow measurements on the moon is still considered to be one of the highest priorities for any future lunar landing geophysical missions. So, uh, so my collaborator, my collaborators and I are sort of in, in anticipation of that kind of mission happening uh, in the near future. Uh, we are designing a heat flow instrument for a uh, uh, future mission to be deployed from a small lunar lander. Then, uh, so in our new instrument, uh, we don't use drill. And uh, so that basically saves a lot of weight. And uh, so our total package is going to weigh only about one and a half kilogram. Then, uh, so we will use, uh, so this is the ins internal sort of uh, 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 architecture of that instrument. And then, so this black thing is the, uh, the, the stem that's made up of uh, uh, fiberglass composite. And it spools out just like a, a steel tape measure spools out of a reel. So, uh, so it has some stiffness that you can point it down. Then at the tip of that stem, uh, we have a, a penetrator cone. Then at the tip of the cone, we have uh, small holes that emit uh, pressurized gas. So, uh, so the, the way the instrument is designed, so basically we push the stem downward, 
And at the same time, we emit this pressurized gas to blow away the loosened soil. And uh, so that's how we actually uh, penetrate into uh, uh, greater depth into lunar regolith. Then at the tip of this penetrating cone, we have also a, a thermal sensor to measure uh, in situ thermal conductivity and the temperature. Then also other temperature measurement sensors are embedded on this stem. So, uh, so we have been testing uh, the excavation system and the temperature measurement system separately so far. Then uh, for the excavation system, we have a keg full of uh, JSC-1A lunar simulant in the uh, uh, vacuum chamber. And then so we have been testing it. Uh, then it looks very promising. Uh, so until, uh, up till these, uh, recently, uh, the so-called uh, device called MOLE has been considered to be the uh, sort of low-power, low-mass uh, option for deploying heat flow probe. Then actually, uh, this MOLE-based heat flow instrument will go to Mars on uh, InSight mission. And uh, so this, uh, this is a schematic of that MOLE system uh, developed by DLR. So it's about a foot long and one inch in diameter. Then it has this internal hammering mechanism. So basically, it uses that momentum to wedge itself into uh, the regolith. Then, uh, so this may work on Mars, but we are not so sure about if that works on the moon because uh, the lunar regolith is very stiff. So uh, if you read some uh, entries from like Apollo lunar journals, you find something like this, uh, like the Apollo 15 and Apollo 17 core tubes required 50 hammer blows by astronauts to get down to 70 centimeters depth. Then we want to go to three meters depth. So, uh, so we needed to come up with some robust way of uh, excavating the lunar regolith. And this uh, technology looks very promising. Then also we are testing the prototype of the uh, in situ thermal conductivity sensor. Again, so we have a prototype. Then uh, we uh, put them in the vacuum chamber. Then we make a side by side measurements with a standard thermal conductivity probe, and then comparing the results. And uh, the the data we're getting so far uh, seems very promising. Then uh, you know uh, we should be able to uh, determine thermal conductivity within like five percent or so in the lunar vacuum at the, in the reg lunar regolith. So uh, while we make these uh, efforts, then of course it's, we still try to extract as much information as possible from the previous heat flow experiments. Then, uh, so I have, I'm collaborating with another group of scientists to uh, recover and fully restore all the data from the Apollo heat flow experiments. So this graph shows you the timeline of the uh, experiments of Apollo 15 and Apollo 17. Then as you can see, the instruments actually kept collecting data till 1977. But but the principal investigators uh, only processed the data up to 1974 so, uh, in writing his uh, final report. So uh, more than two years' worth of data didn't get processed. Then so later, uh, so those data went missing, unfortunately. So uh, then uh, the group based at JAXA and uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, Yoshio Nakamura at the University of Texas were able to recover a big good chunk of it uh, several years ago. Then. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was able to locate about 450 uh, magnetic tapes that contained the data from all the LSEP instruments for a three months period in 1975. So uh, my collaborators and I are going to start working on extracting the data and processing the data, not just the heat flow, but all the LSEP instruments in the next uh, few years. Okay, so this is my last slide. So uh, as a geophysicist, I really feel that we must fully restore and preserve these LSEP data because um, as surface experiment scope, LSEP scope, and the duration of the observation have never been surpassed by any of the uh, uh, more recent robotic missions. And uh, then also surface experiments of this magnitude may never be repeated again. So that makes the LSEP data even more important. Thank you very much. Thank you, CJ. Do we have time for one question? Is there a quick question? Okay, not sure. seeing any. We'll, we'll continue. Oh, we have a question. Jack. Just uh, wondering if uh, you tried your pneumatic control where you have significant size rock fragments. This is something encounter a very large rock fragment. Rotary percussive. Yeah, we haven't tested it with any nuggets or anything in there, yeah. So. Okay. Our next presentation is by Dr. Mark Robinson, who is the principal investigator of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Camera Systems. 
The title is LROC Advances in Lunar Science. Mark. All right. Thank you, Dr. Jolliffe. Okay, this is a uh, oblique image taken of the central peak of Tycho Crater, and one of the uh, fantastic discover. Well, building on fantastic discoveries in the Apollo era is that the uh, state of preservation of Copernican age features is uh, very spectacular. And we had a few images from Lunar Orbiter and from Apollo that showed us that, but now we have images from all around the Moon. Uh, I'll drop down into this a little bit. This is the central peak, as I said. It's about 15 kilometers across on the base right here, and it's 2,000 meters tall, 6,000 feet. And uh, it never ceases to amaze me that a mountain that big can be formed in a few seconds. And if you look at the base of it, you can see that sharp boundary where the impact melt that uh, flooded the bottom of the crater, filled the bottom of the crater, is lapped up against the base of the central peak. And to the left, you can see where it's splashed up a little bit. And I'll look at that in detail. So how do we do the? Ah, there we go. That's easy. Okay, here's a uh, showing you the summit of the central peak, which is just a blow up of that previous image. And to give you a sense of scale, that boulder that's sitting on the top is 130 meters across. It's basically about the size. If you had a, a big crane, you could pick it up and lower it into a football stadium to give you some sense of uh, what what that looks like. The dark material that, line, that is coating the top is impact melt. So I'm not 100% certain how that impact melt got up 6,000 feet. Either the peak rose up through a sea of impact melt or it was splashed up there. But irregardless, it's up there and you can see when you look even more closely details that will convince you 100% that that is impact melt. Okay, here's that uh, splash up feature of impact melt on the bottom of the central peak. This is just a little diversion. This image is so fantastic that I threw it in at the beginning. Now I'll back up to where I really should have started talking. What is LROC? It's actually two, it's actually three cameras, despite the fact it sounds like one. There's two narrow angle cameras, which you see mounted on the spacecraft to the left. I also would like to mention that there's seven science instruments on this uh, spacecraft, and they're all returning fantastic data about the, uh, the moon and the lunar environment. In the upper right, is the view that the moon sees of these spectacular cameras. It's looking down into the barrel. The top is the wide angle camera, and you can see it has two apertures, one for visible light at the top and for UV light at the bottom. Again, it's seven different filters. Those funny looking wings off to the side are just baffles to reject scattered light to improve the signal to noise ratio. On the bottom is one of our beautiful narrow angle cameras that return 50 to 200 centimeter per pixel uh, data. Okay, uh, this is uh, the, probably the most significant result so far from the wide-angle camera is a global digital elevation model at 100 meters per pixel. Um, the, while the, the WAC isn't per se a stereo imager, the way the orbit and the camera was designed, it overlaps about 50% at the equator from orbit to orbit, so that gives us stereo, and this is processed by the DLR in, in Germany into this uh, beautiful data product, and it's on the LROC webpage, so please help yourself. Okay, uh, this is a paper that just came out in Icarus. Actually, it's coming out in January of 2013, but you know how journals are now. You can go get the paper right now. Uh, we analyzed over 24,000 WAC images and 31,500 NAC images over more than a lunar year to map out the illumination conditions at both poles. Uh, this is showing one of the illumination products for the South Pole from the wide angle camera, that's 88 South in that Shackleton crater. Now here's, if you look at that spot right here, a blow up of the narrow angle camera that shows three spots on the rim that are illuminated for uh, much of the uh, lunar year. And if you had three different outposts, solar panels, you would only experience about 43 hours of eclipse throughout a, a lunar day, which is our lunar year, which is a fantastic resource for future explorers. Oh, keep getting mixed up with which keyboard here. Okay, uh, another great result, this is an early result, is Harry Hiesinger and colleagues um, went and redid crater counts for key places on the moon. Uh, Copernicus crater had always been an outlier, didn't fall on the canonical curve. We went back with better image data and counted the craters again. Now it falls right on that crater curve, which lends some degree of confidence to the interpretation of uh, impact crater densities to absolute ages. 
Okay, this is another uh, spiffy result that just came out. Um, I guess it's been about a year now. This was a study led by Paul Spudis, looking in detail with a wide-angle camera and some narrow ca camera angle images of the Serenitatis Basin, which leads into what Jack was just talking about. And with a much better imaging, uh, able to see that it looks like Serenitatis, or the sculptured hills that was sampled by Jack in, at Apollo 17, may very well be Imbrium impact rather than Serenitatis Basin material. So if that is so, then it really makes you think very hard about the chronology of basins as they're laid out. And if Imbrium did form, that puts it, you know, all these basins happen in a very short period of time if that is actually an Imbrium date rather than a um, Serenitatis age date. Okay, uh, more on age dating through crater counting. Now we've got these detailed, excellent imaging for every Mari um, on the moon. Folks are madly cr counting craters all over and dividing them into these small units, which are usually uh, defined by other data sets such as uh, spec spectroscopy. Going in looking at the age dates, we can now see that there's uh, the period that Mari basalt was erupted in Crisium Basin is over a billion years old. It was over a billion years. Okay, one of the uh, really neat early uh, results of the Narango camera was a global survey of looking for compressional features on the moon, which we'd known existed from Apollo era data, but those data were limited to an equatorial band, perhaps only 10% of the moon that had proper lighting for identifying these subtle features. And now from the Narango camera images, we know that they are globally distributed. And that they're very young because they are very small. And the relief on some of these features, although it ranges from um, the biggest being Lee, Lee Lincoln class, which is 100 meters or more of relief, but most of these little bait scarps have on the order of 10 meters of reliefs. So they're formed in the regolith, and so therefore their age that they can exist is very young, perhaps only tens of millions of years. And this tells us that the moon is still in compression and that these features are being formed today, or if they're not being formed today, they just cut off being formed yesterday, which isn't all that likely. And so the, the bottom result of this is that we know the moon's crust is in compression. It's still shrinking, and this is most likely due to the, as the crust, the, the molten por portion of the crust crystallizes out and has a volume change to a solid, the crust is um, being compressed. So that's a pretty simple story. But of course, everything isn't always simple when you start looking at it in detail and you get these great new data sets. But we also see areas of the moon that are an extension, and there's still an extension today because these features are also very small. And in fact, some of them we've seen have only uh, on the order of five to 10 meters of relief. And again, they're formed in the regolith. So if they formed a billion years ago, you would not see them. They would have been eroded away uh, by this point in time. So what is going on here with the simple story that the moon's crust is in compression when we can see in numerous places that it's actually in extension. This is a, a, a big open question. And of course, we're still hunting for more of these features as we continue adding to our data set. Uh, this is just an ad for Dr. Jolliffe's talk, which is coming up next. But I also want to mention, as I said earlier, there's actually seven instruments on the spacecraft. And Diviner has really played an important role in helping map out silicic volcanism. And I'm sure that um, uh, Dr. Greenhagen will mention this in his upcoming talk. Uh, we're going back and re-photographing um, Apollo era photography, looking for new impacts so that we can get a real handle on the meter to 10 meter size bolides that hit the moon. And here's an example of one that's been found. I think we found uh, more than five and less than 10 so far. I'm not sure of the exact number. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the impact melt on these Copernican craters is exceptionally well preserved. And this is one of uh, my favorites is Giordano Bruno Crater. I'm not really sure how old this crater is. Uh, there was a paper a couple of years ago from Kagua team putting the uh, upper limit on the age as, t as 10 million years. Uh, other people are working on this problem. And it may be that some of the very few craters that we see are actually auto-secondaries, and the age may be uh, much younger. OK, Mari pits were originally discovered by the Kagua team with their 10 meter, uh, beautiful 10 meter data. We went back and re-imaged these. And one of the interesting aspects is testing the hypothesis that the pits, by the way, this is 100 meters across, and it's 100 meter deep, that these were actually formed into lava tubes. 
So we slewed the spacecraft over in this geometry when the sun was just right. So that boulder right there is that boulder right there. This is all the same pit. So anything you're seeing in this picture over here is underground, showing that this is, at least it goes back 20 meters. Now the exciting question is, does it go back 100 meters, kilometer, 10 kilometers? I don't know, but I'd love to put a rover down there to go find out. And again, another big surprise is that we're now finding lots of these pits. And most of them are in impact melt. And there's a poster tomorrow uh, by Robert Wagner that uh, details this discovery. And the way we find most of these automatically, by the way. And this is a, a fascinating pit right here. There's actually a little natural bridge. So could you imagine being an astronaut, driving a rover, getting up on the edge of that natural bridge and looking off to either side? It's about seven meters across. It's really fantastic. But the science here is that um, those complex plumbing systems that form inside these impact melt sheets, which is, a, at least to me, a big surprise. And also, the, these pits, be them in mare or impact melt, are a geologic museum, and there's got to be all sorts of perfectly preserved, delicate textures and minerals um, that aren't exposed to the space environment. And of course, there's an engineering uh, boon here that it might be a great place to go and build shelters to protect astronauts from um, hazards in space, be it uh, radiation, micrometeorite, and, uh, and you also don't need to have to build a structure. You could just bring an inflatable in there and fill it up and be right at home. Okay, uh, my conclusion here is the time is right to return to the moon and gradually leave the Apollo era uh, samples and data to the textbooks where, uh, as we continue to bring back more samples and explore the moon more fully. So the moon is an incredibly inviting destination, uh, aesthetically, scientifically, and economically. There's lots of lunar science to be done, not only uh, science of the moon, but science from the moon, uh, solar system science and beyond. And it's also a very important engineering test bed for human exploration of the solar system. So as we, as a species, uh, leave our planet and move forward, the moon will play a key role in that venture. And finally, as uh, Jack mentioned earlier, that it's a resource depot that we will eventually exploit, and I'm hoping that I will see that in my lifetime. In fact, I'm cautiously optimistic. All right, thank you very much. We have time for a question. While you're thinking of a question, let me point out that Dr. Robinson brought with him a beautiful image of the Apollo 17 landing site, an oblique image, and I invite you to come up after the session and have a quick have a look at that. Or we'll and, spread it out on the floor. And I would also take an opportunity to point out that we have a number of excellent posters, and the poster session for this session is this afternoon. Questions? Yes, we have one question. Go ahead. Just a, a pattern recognition, and we use high sun images, you know, noontime images. Well, it's a, it's a shadow being cast, because most normal geologic materials don't have 90-degree slopes on them. So if you're casting a shadow, and it's not fully automated, it actually creates a little, um, it, whenever it finds it's a possible pit, it pulls it out, it makes a little uh, 200 by 200, I think, uh, and then puts it in a directory, and then a human being sits there and very rapidly goes through all the possible finds and sorts them out from the negative to the positives. And there's the, Robert Wagner, as I mentioned earlier, has got a poster at explaining pit scan um, tomorrow. Okay, yes. Uh, the, the biggest one is, I believe, is Copernicus Crater. And, then the, and it also has the biggest pit in the impact melt, and it's quite large. It's hundreds of, hundreds of meters. I think it's close to kilometers. Is that right, Robert? Are you in here? No, no, they, all the way from craters down to, you know, kilometer scale up to 100 kilometer scale. Okay, thanks very much, Mark. To move on to our next presentation, this is by Dr. Ben Greenhagen, who is the deputy PI for the Diviner Instrument on LRO. The title is Using Apollo Sites and Soils to Compositionally Ground Truth Diviner Lunar Radiometer Observations. Ben. All right, thank you. 
So, uh, yeah, like Brad was saying, today I will be uh, talking about the legacy of Apollo in the sense of uh, understanding the Diviner compositional uh, investigation observations. Um, thanks to, to Mark, uh, you now know that LRO, Diviner is one of seven instruments on LRO. It's a mid, -infrared, uh, mapping, mid and far infrared mapping radiometer for the most part with a uh, spatial resolution of about 200 meters. Uh, the spectral channels are shown on the plot on the bottom left. And um, the channels that we care about for uh, this talk uh, are all centered about uh, eight microns. Okay, green. Here are uh, some uh, Apollo samples that have been measured in simulated lunar environment and the approximate uh, central uh, passband locations of the Diviner 8 micron channels superimposed on them. Um, the channels were chosen uh, because uh, based on the observations that were available uh, at the time of design, which actually were just these, these spectra on the right side, uh, showed not too much spectral uh, features in the mid-infrared. And so we put our three channels around uh, the Chris Johnson feature, which is this, this diagnostic mid-infrared emissivity maximum, um, so that we could characterize it. Uh, spectra on the left are some newer uh, measurements that we've taken in and simulated lunar environment uh, from the Diviner team, and I'll talk about those more at the end of the talk. Chris Johnson feature is related to the fundamental vibrational uh, bands of uh, uh, silicates and uh, shifts to shorter wavelengths with increasing silicate polymerization. So we have a ternary diagram up here on the left with plagioclase on the top, pyroxene on the left, and olivine on the right. Uh, we have most high sensitivity to the uh, plagioclase olivine ratio where you get unique uh, CF values interpreted from diviner for both plagioclase and olivine compositions. We also do have high sensitivity to the plagioclase pyroxene ratio, uh, but it's not unique. Uh, if you have a secondary data set like a near infrared data set that gives you good distinction between olivine and pyroxene abundances, then you can really nail down the compositions uh, uh, if you include diviner data. Uh, we also find that the uh, Christiansen feature is correlated to some geochemical species, in particular um, aluminum and iron, which are related to the feldspar mafic ratios. Um, the unique uh, lunar environment uh, is one of the reasons why, when we look at Apollo soils and simulate lunar environment, we don't see very many other diagnostic features. Uh, we get very strong thermal gradients in the upper few hundred microns. I hope many of you were able to see uh, Carrie Donsel Hanna's talk on Monday morning, where she described this in detail. Um, also, the fine particulate nature of the, the surface and uh, presence of agglutinates leads to reduced restrolin bands and enhancement of the CF. The data that I'm presenting uh, today are all from uh, the uh, low altitude uh, 50 kilometer mapping orbits from Diviner. Uh, they've been corrected for illumination and viewing geometry, a type of, of mid infrared photometry that we do to the data, uh, but not for soil maturity. We do find that the Chris Johnson feature. Uh, shifts to longer wavelengths with increasing maturity, and, and that's an ongoing issue that we're trying to better understand. Uh, this shows the uh, midday uh, low altitude coverage for Diviner for each of the Apollo sites. Uh, we have Clementine albedo maps on the top and Diviner uh, CF overlaid on uh, WAC uh, geomorphology mosaic on the bottom, and the locations of each site are indicated. Um, you can see by the, the colors of, of the Diviner data that um, the Apollo 11 and 12 sites uh, are on a, a more mafic uh, Mario material than the intermediate Apollo 14. We also have uh, Apollo 15, 16, and 17, uh, with Apollo 16 being uh, the standout uh, on the, the Highlands materials. Um, I'll take a, a closer look at Apollo 16 um, in the, the next few slides. This is a traverse map from the USGS for Apollo 16 on the left. And on the right, I've shown a, a selection of uh, measurements in simulated lunar environment uh, for different Apollo 16 soils. These are a, a very nice suite of soils that were actually measured uh, shortly after Apollo in the early 1970s. Uh, Apollo 16 in particular, they, they looked at a, a quite a few samples. Um, and uh, uh, so this makes it a, a good place to, to examine the diviner data in this context. Um, the, in the simulated lunar environment, they found that the uh, stations 1 and 10 uh, have uh, kind of uh, uh, CFs that are uh, uh, distinctive for a mature, uh, high uh, feldspathic composition. Station 11 uh, is uh, similar to a very immature um, plagioclase-rich composition. And station 4B is, is a little anomalous because this is actually kind of a mafic um, uh, spectrum uh, when, when I look at it. 
and uh, we have to explain that. When we overlay the diviner data, we've now colorized that traverse map using the diviner data. Um, we uh, see that we get very good agreement for stations 10 and 1, uh, these two stations here in the middle. Uh, if we add station uh, 4B, we don't get as good of an agreement, um, but uh, when you take into account that this, the soil that was returned from station 4B is actually very similar uh, to the soils that were returned from stations 1 and 10, uh, and the diviner data is showing spectra that uh, are also very similar to 1 and 10. We think that this is probably indicating uh, uh, some potential experimental error uh, in the measurement of the sample. And these, although the, the, the notion of these experiments is very simple, the execution is difficult and you do have to get the environmental parameters correct. For station 11, we have a kind of a different offset. Uh, here we have a, a, a less mature feldspathic uh, composition measured with diviner. Uh, we, th we think that the explanation for the offset here is that uh, the sample, in particular, 67711, uh, is described as a friable uh, white rock and uh, might not actually be distinctive of the larger uh, spatial resolution that we're looking at with the diviner. We have looked at uh, 14, 15, and 17. Uh, additionally, uh, looking at, at multiple sampling stations, for Apollo 11 and 12, uh, things are just so close together that it's hard to pull out individual sampling stations with diviner data. And for, for scale, Apollo 14, here is on the same scale as Apollo 17. You can see you don't get very much separation between the different sites. Um, if you've seen uh, some of this work presented previously, we have made substantial improvements in the quality of the diviner data. We're now looking at uh, spectra and pulling out data from about 300 meter uh, blocks and using some, some sub-pixel analysis to help with that, and it really is uh, helping with the data. Um, so when we take this data and we compare it to uh, the geochemistry from the return to Apollo sites, uh, we get trends like this. This is the diviner data on the left, uh, a fairly linear trend between the feldspathic compositions uh, from Apollo 16, uh, going through the, uh, the Mari compositions and out to the, um, the high iron uh, glasses from Apollo 17. Um, the laboratory measurements on the right don't have as good of a trend, and we think a lot of this is due to the experimental error. It's one of the reasons why we want to do uh, some of these experiments and repeat some of the soils that were uh, measured before. Um, I've put some arrows on here uh, to indicate why we might be following off the trend on the left side too. Uh, there is the sampling bias uh, that uh, we have to be aware of. We need to make sure that when we're comparing to Apollo soils, we're comparing to ones that really are representative of a 300 meter uh, surface and, and not to just a particular rock or a particular uh, bright spot. And then the data quality, and I mentioned we, uh, we've done a complete reanalysis here and the data quality has, um, has, has shrunk by uh, a noticeable amount. Um, aluminum and iron are, are directly related, so uh, the correlation trend is also quite good for iron. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to mention that we are doing some of these simulated lunar environment experiments for the first time in about 40 years. Uh, we have an active setup at University of Oxford that's doing these measurements, a uh, setup uh, at JPL and a setup at, at Brown University that are, are getting very close to being able to, um, to do the full simulated lunar environment and also are planning another uh, lab at uh, Stony Brook. And so we will have lots of capability. We're trying to get more samples. CAP10, fortunately, uh, gave us additional eight uh, samples. Uh, this fall to look at. Uh, and we are a little bit more limited than some of the geochemical analyses because we do need about three grams of material. And so that, that limits the amount we can get a little bit. So in conclusion, uh, the Apollo sites and the return soils really are critical uh, to understanding the diviner compositional investigation. Uh, the preliminary analysis are encouraging uh, and, and we have lots of future work. Uh, particularly the validation and utilization of, of the iron correlation. Uh, Carl Allen has been a, a large proponent for this work. He's been using it to map out the iron concentrations of pyroclastic deposits for which we don't have samples and has published some of that work. Uh, investigation of the CF versus plagioclase mafic ratio. I hope many of you uh, were able to participate in the session uh, earlier this morning where Jeff Taylor and Sarah Kreitz talked about some of this work that's ongoing at Hawaii. Uh, validation of our, our photometric correction and then also uh, the measurement of additional soils in simulated lunar, in simulated lunar environment. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. It's a rich uh, data set that Diviner is giving us, and good to see this use of Apollo samples to better understand it. Uh, questions? Okay, seeing no questions, thanks, Ben. We'll move on to the next presentation. 
This is by Dr. Lars Borg. The title is Evaluation of Ages in the Lunar Highlands with Implications for the Evolution of the Moon. Sounds intriguing, Lars. Thanks, Brad. Okay, um, determining the age of the moon and, and constraining the age of the two suites of lunar highland samples have been long-standing themes of lunar science. Uh, since the samples were returned from Apollo 40 years ago, the results, however, have been fairly ambiguous. This stems in large part from the great difficulty associated with dating these samples. We have formed a group and we have an initiative to try and go back and look at the chronology of the lunar highlands using modern chronologic techniques. As part of this, we're going to go back and evaluate some of the older ages that have been reported in the literature because obviously there's too many ages for us to go back and redo everything. So I'm going to present the results of that today. I'm going to begin by showing you some of the inadequacies associated with many of the past chronologic investigations and provide some criteria that can be used to assess the reliability of individual ages. I'm going to present some of the most reliable ages and then discuss their significance. The bottom line here is that most of the ancient ages that we have are some of the least convincing. In other words, they appear to be the least reliable. And instead, there appears to be a plethora of ages at about three point, or excuse me, 4.35 billion years ago. And the geologic significance of that, uh, I think, still remains to be seen. So this is a, a summary slide showing you the, the basic problem here. This is a plot showing uh, various ages that have been determined on the two suites of rocks. The Fro and Anorthosite ages are presented here. Uh, ages that have been determined on the Magnesium suite are over here. All these ages are done by Samarium neodymium, which is deemed by most of us to be the most reliable because it's the least affected by diffusional processes. According to the magma ocean model, we predict that this suite of rocks should be significantly or at least measurably older than this suite of rocks. And you can see that it's not. And this gives us some cause for worry and thinking that maybe the chronology uh, is an error somehow. The alternative, of course, is that the magma ocean model is wrong. So this underscores uh, or illustrates some of the difficulties associated with these measurements. What I plotted here are ages that have been determined by individual analyses on multiple lunar samples here. And I've listed the types of, uh, of age dating criteria that have been used here. But the point to note is that each of these individual samples has a wide range of ages. And so ultimately, we need some criteria that we can use to decide which one of these ages is most likely to represent the true, true crystallization age of the rock and which ones of these ages uh, are actually uh, reflect artifacts of the analysis. So to give you a, an example of some of the difficulties associated with this, I'm picking on some data that, that I produced um, about 12, 13 years ago on a Frohn and Ortho site, 62236. We determined an age which is represented by this isochron diagram down here of about 4.29 billion years. This plot shows a, a plot of the samarium neodymium ratio against the neodymium isotopic composition. Individual mineral fractions are analyzed. A line is regressed through those mineral fractions, and the slope of that line is proportional to the age. The uncertainties, and usually the main criteria we use to assess the quality of the data, are how good this line fits these data. And that's basically reflected in the uncertainty in the age. The problem with this age, of course, is it's exceedingly young. But there's other isotopic systems that have been completed on this rock, and they show some of the, some of the difficulties. Up here in, in this panel is a plot of the rubidium strontium isotopic data for the same sample. And you can see that there's a lot of scatter in this data, reflecting some sort of a metamorphic event, probably associated with impact. If we make our best guess at a line that going through here, we get an age that's about 3.8 billion years. So clearly it's discordant from what we're interpreting as the samarium neodymium age as reflecting the crystallization of the sample. There's other in instances where we can see uh, other complexities, and it's 
represented on this panel here, which is a plot of the results of various isochrons. This is the age, or essentially the, the slope of the isochron, versus initial epsilon neodymium, which is essentially the, the y-intercept. I know most of you guys aren't isotope geochemists here, but the point here is that if you look at a growth model for what we suspect to be the bulk moon, it should lie along a line like this. Samples that lie in this field are argued to be derived from strongly incompatible element depleted sources. Samples that lie down here are from more incompatible element rich sources. Both the magnesium suite and the Froner Northosite suite are thought to be derived from sources that should lie down here. So clearly we have some, uh, some issues associated with this that uh, underscore the potential that some of these isotopics are, are disturbed. So this is a list of criteria that we're using to delineate the most reliable ages. And I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. The first is that, uh, is there con concordancy between multiple chronometers? The chronometers that are being used, are they reliable? For example, if you have an argon-argon age, it's very likely to reflect a, a metamorphic event, but it's unlikely to reflect a crystallization event. M more reliable chronometers are things like samarium neodymium and lutetium hafnium as far as recording crystallization ages because these elements don't diffuse as rapidly during secondary heating events. We also use the linearity of the isochrons, which is a traditional uh, approach. We look and see if the initial isotopic compositions are realistic. And finally, we use the criteria that do the data that we determine for the concentrations and the mineral fractions for the parent and daughter ratios, do those match what's been measured by ion microprobe studies in thin sections? So if we do this and we go through and we look at the data, we can provide a sort of a, a grading chart here. On the upper uh, axis of this plot here are the five criteria that are being used. On the, on the vertical row here is various samples that have been dated. And these, incidentally, are for ferroin or northocytes. So some of the, and they're, and they're going from best to worst in this order. So if you see a green box here, it means it meets the criteria. If it gets all green all the way across, five out of five, give it a, a letter grade of an A, one out of five is a B, two, two, two out of five is a C, so on, et cetera. The point to note here is that the only age that has uh, the highest grade or even a grade greater than a B is on one frown or northocyte, and it has an age of about 4.36 billion years. All the other data, ours, ours included, uh, have some problems that look like they're suspect. The magnesium sweet data are presented here. There's obviously a lot more of them. They're significantly easier to date. There's a few samples that aren't included here. The point to note again here is that if you look at the grades, uh, about half of them have grades that are uh, higher than B uh, or better. And if you look at all of the old ages that have been determined on these samples, they all lie down here in the bottom, so they appear to be the least reliable. The other point to note about this slide is that this age that's recorded here of about 4.35 is seen over and over and over again in these sample suites. So the question is, is, is this age recorded in other places? And the answer is it is. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples of that. This is a, a summary of zircon ages that have been determined by electron or ion microprobe. Each one of these uh, these points here represents an individual spot that's been analyzed. The point that I want to make here is that if you look at a peak of ages in the Apollo 17 site, you see uh, it corresponds to an age of about 4.34, again uh, showing a, a match with what we see in both the Froen and Orthocyte and MG suites. The final types of ages that we have for the moon uh, involve model ages. This is a couple of examples of them. This is a plot, again, of the, the TI diagram I showed you earlier. These data here are all the data that meet the uh, B or better grade criteria. An age, a model age, can be calculated by regressing a line through these data and look where it intercepts the chondritic evolution curve. In this particular case, uh, we calculate an age of about 4.39, plus or minus about 50 million years. So again, this is in fairly good agreement with what we see uh, in the other suites. The final model age I'm going to show here is a little more complicated. This is based on the decay of Sumerium 146 which has a half-life of 103 million years. 
This incidentally uh, is an age that dates the formation of the, the Mari basalt source region. Individual Mari basalts have been analyzed here. The 142 that's measured in the bulk rock is, is presented on this axis. The samarium neodymium ratio calculated for the sources presented on this axis. The slope of this line corresponds to the model age for the formation of the Mari basalts. This study's been done multiple times, but the average age that's been recorded is presented here. It's about 4.34 plus or minus about 20 million years. So the point is, is that we're seeing this age over and over and over again. So again, to, to beat this home, this is a, a summary of the various ages that uh, I just presented. Here's the age on the Froen and Ortho site that has an A grade. It's about a 4.36. These are ages that have been determined on MG suite rocks, but you can see that there's three or four samples right in here that have ages of about 4.34. These are the, the ages for peaks for the zircons. This is the uh, Apollo 17 peak. This is the peak for Apollo 14, slightly younger. And then these are the two model ages that we uh, have determined based on the decay of Sumerium 147 and the decay of, of Sumerium 146. And they all fall into a, an average value somewhere around 4.35 billion years. Incidentally, uh, we just completed some analyses on hafmium, uh, and I saw the plot for the first time about half an hour ago, and the model age we get from that system is about 4.42. It's probably going to have an uncertainty of about 70 million years or so. So again, it agrees with, with these model ages and that there seems to be a, a, a major event of some sort occurring at this point. So to, uh, to, to finish, I think this leads to two basic scenarios, um, which are mutually exclusive, of course. Uh, the first is that the, the moon is old. Uh, the peak of ages at 4.35 billion years must record a, a pulse of magmatism, and this magmatism is not associated with the solidification of the magma ocean. Perhaps this reflects uh, a magmatic event that's triggered by overturn. Uh, or it may reflect uh, magmatism and, and, and motion in, in the lunar mantle associated with uh, impact of, of South Pole Aiken, or s but it's some major event. The, the requirement here is that uh, we need a second mechanism to produce Froen and orthocytes. The Froen and orthocytes cannot be flotation cumulates of a magma ocean, at least the ones that we have so far. There has to be another mechanism to produce them. Otherwise, they're recording uh, an age that, that's too young. Uh, and we expect the fans and the MG suites to overlap as, as they appear to do. I'm almost done. Uh, and then the, the final uh, ramification of this is that the ancient magma ocean cumulates m must exist somewhere, but we just haven't sampled them or been able to date them with enough confidence that we know that we're actually constraining the solidification of the moon. The second scenario is that the moon is not old and that the moon is young. In this case, the best estimate for the, the solidification of the moon is the age of the Frona Northocyte, which is at 4.39 plus or minus about 3 million years. This is from a paper we put out last year. Uh, it might also be recorded in the Crete model ages from Samarium neodymium, which are roughly at 4.39, or maybe even the Lutetium hafmium age at 4.42. But it's still, it's going to be fairly, fairly young. Um, this, uh, this age that we've determined from the fans, of course, is concordant with the age that we measure for the Mari basalt source region. So this, of course, is, is consistent with that. If the fans are the flotation cumulates representing the felsic end of, of the solidification, the Mari basalts are going to represent the mafic end. Uh, the younger zircon ages uh, must record a pulse of magmatism as well as the MG suite rocks that must closely follow the solidification of the magma ocean. And the overall implication for this in the big picture is that the short time interval associated with accretion and solidification of the moon after the giant impact would require that this occur relatively recently uh, in solar system history. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. Who says it's not a dynamic moon? The crust is getting thinner, the moon is getting younger, and the whole thing's getting wetter. 
Um, question. <laughs> Barbara Cohen. Yeah, I haven't processed all all of that. the The thought that I would I would add, give to you is that there are MG sweet rocks that appear to have crystallized at vast depths. Uh, the troctolite seven six five three five, for example, is thought to have crystallized at you know twenty to thirty kilometers depth. And so, if we're producing the MG sweet rocks as a superficial process, we have to explain mechanisms to produce rocks like the troctolite as well. Another question? Quick question? Jack? Okay, one final quick question. Yes, Francis. Yeah, that's right. There's, there's a concordance of ages between the most ancient lunar ones and the most ancient uh, terrestrial ones that seems perhaps not to be a coincidence. Okay, thanks, Lars. I'm glad we have these well-curated samples so that we can continue to address these questions with the gift that keeps on giving. Okay, now for our next speaker, Dr. Rebecca Gent. Her title is Constraints on the Recent Rate of Lunar Regolith Accumulation from Diviner Observations. Becky. So now shifting to uh, very shallow processes, um, we will talk a little bit about what I think are the first observational constraints on the rate at which surface ejecta, rocky ejecta material is being processed by, by micrometeorite and other um, bombardment. So the problem is basically this, that if you look at the radar data sets that we have available, shown here are two terrestrial um, radar data sets from Arecibo and Green Bank and the LRO Mini RF data. You see that most of the young craters, young meaning anything lower Imbrian and, and younger, on the near side of the moon show abundant ejecta, uh, blocky ejecta, as indicated by the high circular polarization ratios um, that we see in the ejecta blankets. But if you look at the diviner rock abundance data set, for those of you who are not familiar with this, Josh Vanfield um, and some of the rest of us wrote a paper last year uh, detailing how these rock abundance measurements are, or observations are calculated. If you look at the rock abundance data from Diviner, Diviner for the near side of the moon, you see that most craters, like this Kaiser C, which is the same crater that I just showed here, are approximately rock-free on the surface in their ejecta blankets. And here's a nice um, NAC image showing the rim of Kaiser C, and, and you just don't see any rocks on the surface. So I interpret this to mean that large ejecta blocks are quickly removed from the surface. So, you know, you look at, at the front side of the moon, it's approximately rock-free. So the rocks must be being removed very quickly. And the remaining blocks, the ones that we see in the radar CPR data, must be buried beneath some uh, amount of thermally insulating regolith material. So the questions that I'm trying to address are these. How fast are the rocky ejecta on the surface removed? And also, how fast is the subsurface rock material processed and to what depth? Um, so we'll address the first of those first. Um, these are some of Josh's rock abundance and regolith temperature maps. 
In the calculation of surface rock abundance, there are two results. One is the fraction by area of the surface that's covered by exposed rocks. And the second is the temperature of the other fraction of each observed pixel, pixel, which is the regolith temperature. So if you think of each pixel as being some linear combination of exposed rocks and soil, separately those two things are calculated, what the surface fraction of rocks is and what the temperature of the remaining soil is. Um, and the maps look like this. So in, in areas of mare, for instance, you can see that the rock abundances are much higher than they are in the highlands, as you would expect, because the regolith is much thinner. Um, so it's been observed um, that the surface rock abundance, not surprisingly, decreases with increasing crater age. So here we have a range of craters from Tycho all the way down to Manilius here, and you can see that you know, as they get older, the surface rock abundance decreases. So the question is, can we quantify that um, and you know, make a correlation between how much rock material is being removed and the age of those craters? So I've um, estimated that by some equations that you probably don't care about right now, but the, the surface rock abundance is, is simply a, a ratio of the surface covered by exposed rocks to the total surface of the pixel being observed. And we can um, gain subtraction on what that means if we use well-known size frequency distributions for ejecta, um, comminuted ejecta, such as this distribution here, which I framed, it's usually framed in terms of mass, but I framed it in terms of um, rock diameter. And so the cumulative um, size frequency curve that you get from a power law like this for, looks like this for Surveyor 7, based on lunar orbiter photographs and Surveyor 7 photographs. And so I've fit um, these two parameters. There should be a gamma right here, the gamma and K, these two constants, to the Surveyor 7 data. And I've applied that to the other craters um, that I've investigated. And so with these parameter values, um, I'll just digest this all and say that the mass per unit area represented by those surface rocks turns out to be directly proportional to the average rock abundance, which is not so surprising. So if we assume a density for the rocks um, and use this to figure out how much mass per unit area there is in an ejecta blanket, um, we can plot the, that surface mat rock mass as a function of crater age. So this is a log-log plot, and we see that this is very nicely behaved for um, these 11 young craters for which I could find reliable ages in the data, uh, sorry, in the literature. Some of these, I should say, are new data from Harry Hiesinger and Carolyn Vanderbogert and their students using um, the new NAC images. So these are new counts for some of the craters like um, Copernicus, which Mark mentioned earlier. Also, this age for Giordano, Giordano Bruno is the, the mean age quoted in that Moroda paper from Kagoya data, which is four million years, but it could be anywhere between one and 10. In any case, we see that there's a really well-behaved relationship here between those two things. So now let's turn to the subsurface rock material. Um, the key concept here is that shallow subsurface ejecta blocks influence the regolith temperature, the other parameter that we can measure from diviner. So if you have a rock sitting right under the surface, the surface temperature that you'll see of the regolith, even though it's covered with, it, the rock may be covered with regolith, will be higher than if there were no rock in the subsurface, down to some depth. And so um, we can match the nighttime temperature evolution of um, you know, any given spot on the moon to one-dimensional thermal models, which the Diviner team has been using with great success to match um, the nighttime temperatures around the moon. And so the, the slope of these nighttime cooling curves are really the key parameter. If you have a very high thermal inertia, um, you know, the, the nighttime temperature doesn't change very much because the rocks don't cool off very much. Um, a low thermal inertia, the nighttime cooling happens much more quickly. And if we assume um, an exponential density profile with depth, which again has been, it, this isn't coming out of thin air, this is, is actually um, motivated by observations from the Apollo core data from a number of other sources. Um, if we assume this exponential um, profile of density with depth, we can frame the thermal inertia in terms of density and we can get a handle on um, the best fit density structure in the regolith. And so if we do that and we constrain the surface density here and the um, bulk density from these observations, we really just have to fit this parameter H, which is kind of the, the E-folding depth of our exponential um, uh, density curve. And so I'm just going to skip ahead here. This is what the density curve looks like as a function of depth. And so a young crater that has lots of 
regular, lots of ejecta close to the surface might have a very shallow H value and old craters a deeper H value. And so we can make maps that look like this where we plot age as a function of position, et cetera. And the key thing that we do here is that we compare the mass represented by the subsurface ejecta in the ejecta blanket to that of the outside regolith. So if we just integrate that density as a function of depth, we get mass per unit area, and we find that the, the difference between the ejecta and the outside area is just proportional to the difference in that H value. Um, so we get the, basically the same plot. <laughs> if, we, if we plot the excess mass um, represented in the shallow subsurface in the ejecta blankets versus age, again, we get a very well-behaved relationship. And if we add them together, we get the total mass processed. Um, and this, this is sensitive down to about, I'd say, a meter depth. So for the first time now, I think we have a relationship between how much mass is being removed from the surface down to about a meter um, in the rocky ejecta blankets versus, versus age. And you can see that there's a very nice correlation here. These are 95% confidence intervals. On a linear plot, this is what that relationship looks like. And if we calculate then, if we convert that mass per unit area into an equivalent um, vertical extent of rock material that's being removed per year, we can see that we get these kind of numbers, which are you know, in the ballpark of what people have predicted in the past. The important thing here is that we see that initially there's quite a lot of rock material removed very quickly and then it tails off very, very fast, which is, again, not so surprising. So my conclusions are, just to restate, this is the first, as far as I know, observational constraint on the rate of, of ejecta processing. Um, and the surface rocks and the ejecta blocks in the, in the upper one meter, um, you know, the, the rate of processing falls off very quickly. A, as you remove rocks, so the pool decreases, and B, so you cover those remaining rocks with the regolith finds that result from the comminution of the rocks, and therefore um, those are protected. Just to drive that point home a little bit, um, we can see that rocks in the subsurface seem to persist for quite a long time. So just looking again at Copernicus, which was one of my, you know, older craters here, um, Again, here's the rock abundance data, so you can see that the rocks on the surface are, are mostly gone. Um, but in the radar data, you can see that there are quite a few very sharp, blocky ejecta um, particles remaining in the subsurface. And if we look at an even older crater, La Perouse, which um, has a, a nice new date that's just been calculated, it's way off the graph over here. It's way outside our, our, our range of resolution, so we have no diviner signal at all. And yet there seems to be quite a bit of ejecta material remaining. That ejecta only needs to be buried by, say, 20 or 30 centimeters of regolith before a diviner doesn't see it. And so um, this gives us an insight into the fate of these subsurface ejecta blocks and how long they might persist. And uh, that's the end. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Okay, looks like you're off, off the hook. Thank you, Becky. The next uh, presentation is by Dr. Francis McCubbin. His topic is Appetite in Lunar Samples, Implications for the Origin of Volatile Reservoirs in the Moon. Francis. <clears throat> Thanks, Brad. And I'd like to thank the conveners for, um, or the conveners for inviting me. So I'm going to talk about volatiles in the moon. So in general, volatile elements are highly depleted in the moon. So little is known about uh, how magmatic volatiles like water, fluorine, and chlorine have affected eruption processes and magma generation and, and what role they've played in phase equilibria and the physical properties of the lunar interior. However, we do know that volatiles um, are present within lunar magmatic systems and within the lunar interior. We have evidence of volatile-assisted uh, pyroclastic eruptions through the <clears throat> existence of the volcanic glass beads that have been found during the Apollo missions. We also have some very highly vesiculated basalts that have been collected uh, during Apollo. And a lot of the basalts have some volatile-bearing mineral phases, in particular aptite, which is a calcium phosphate mineral that contains fluorine, chlorine, and hydroxyl as an essential structural constituent. So it has only been very recently that people have started actually quantifying uh, the volatile contents of these uh, potentially volatile-bearing phases. Uh, there's been some work led by Alberto Sal and Eric Cowrie looking at the volatile contents of some of the volcanic glasses, 
both the glasses themselves, which have degassed, as well as olivine hosted melt inclusions within the glasses uh, that may, <clears throat> may have not degassed. They find up to 1,200 ppm water within some of those olivine hosted melt inclusions. And, um, you know, as far as fluorine, sulfur, and chlorine, up to, you know, 70 or 80 ppm fluorine, a few hundred ppm sulfur, and uh, about two and a half ppm chlorine. As far as the appetite, um, that's sort of been led by myself, uh, a group led by Jeremy Boyce, and one led by Jim Greenwood, uh, where we've been looking at. Uh, Sims uh, volatile, volatile contents for fluorine, water, and uh, chlorine. Although I only focus on the studies that look at all three. Uh, Jim Greenwood mostly looks at hydrogen and also the D to H, uh, which I'm not going to get into. So the lunar appetites are primarily dominated by fluorine, uh, but they do have OH, so, uh, so the lunar magmas, uh, including the glasses and the mari basalts, do seem to have some OH. However, you know, how do, how do these uh, volatile contents actually, what do they tell us about the thermal and magmatic evolution of the moon and the distribution of volatiles in the interior? Well, to be honest, we need to look at both. We can't just look at the glasses or the appetite. Uh, the glasses give us a very direct probe of melt volatile abundances um, because they're a direct measure of the volatile contents of a melt, although you do have to worry about uh, degassing. And the appetites, uh, which are an indirect measure of uh, volatile contents in the melt, occur in a wider array of samples than just the glasses. So the glasses give us an idea of uh, partial melts from kind of the deep to mid-lunar mantle, whereas appetites occur in creep-rich creep uh, impact melts within crustal rocks and within mare basalts. In order to use appetite to understand uh, magmatic volatile contents, we first need to understand the partitioning uh, behavior and relationship of fluorine and chlorine and water between appetite and silicate melts. And this has caused sort of a big push for some experimental work, uh, some led by my lab as well as uh, Jim Webster, and I believe uh, Jeremy Boyce and Craig Manning are also doing some experiments. And so far, we've, we've got a very limited data set, but from the results from my lab, we're finding that the mineral melt devalues themselves very uh, substantially. Um, however, if you look at the ratio of the devalues, so the exchange KD values, uh, those are remaining relatively constant. Um, overall, uh, water, or sorry, fluorine partitions about 100 times more strongly than water, and chlorine partitions about 25 times more strongly than water. So water is not partitioning very strongly in appetite at all. So the, the low abundances of hydroxyl that we tend to find in some of the lunar appetites don't necessarily mean that the, magma, uh, the magmas from which they formed were very low in water. So if we take these exchange KD values, we can actually project fields into uh, the appetite ternary where we've got fluorine, chlorine, and uh, OH at the apices. And the region in blue, both the light blue and the dark blue, represents, um, if you have appetite plotting within that region, you've got a melt that's got more water than chlorine and more chlor or sorry, more water than chlorine or fluorine on a weight basis. Uh, the area in green indicates, if you've got appetite plotting there, indicates it probably formed from a melt with more chlorine than water or fluorine. And that really small uh, purple area up against the floor apex is where you have appetite forming from a fluorine-dominated melt. Uh, and this sort of illustrates the, the really strong preference for fluorine uh, in the appetite, um, at least between about zero uh, or one bar and uh, one GPA. And interestingly enough, if you're only looking at appetite by electron microprobe, you can't actually tell the difference between a fluorine-dominated melt and a water-dominated melt. You really need uh, SIMS analyses because there are some issues with analyzing appetite by electron microprobe. So if we take the SIMS analyses from, uh, from my, myself and Jeremy Boyce and plot them into this area, we see that, <clears throat> oh yeah, we see that uh, this group of uh, samples here, which are all uh, mari basalts, plot within this field indicating more water than fluorine and more fluorine than chlorine. And we've got one, only really one sample from crustal rocks that have been analyzed by SIMS thus far for fluorine, chlorine, OH. And they plot in this region indicating higher chlorine than water and fluorine. 
Uh, so there, it's an interesting difference, but can we really be using you know, the appetite to discriminate relative volatile abundances? So uh, there's a problem, and, and you can tell by its name. Uh, appetite is from the Greek root, uh, Greek root apate, which means deceit, and it is aptly named. Um, there are some problems with analyzing appetite electron microprobe because uh, there's some fluorine issues. If you want to talk about it, we can go on for hours uh, offline. The appetite melt partitioning experiments are still um, in their infancy. We have a lot more work to do, and we don't really understand how the partitioning is going to change as a function of pressure, temperature, uh, potentially FO2. Melt composition is going to play a very large uh, role. And also, appetite composition could be important. Also, appetite tends to crystallize late within the crystallization sequence of lunar magmas and, and most other magmas as well, making extrapolation to parent melt volatile contents difficult and not exact. And <clears throat> additionally, appetite compositions will be affected by the volatile history of apparent melt. So if you had mixing or degassing that occurred, this is going to affect the eventual appetite composition or, uh, from the appetite that forms from that melt. But we have these mari basalts in the, uh, <clears throat> and the picritic glasses, which both form by partial melting of the lunar mantle. So let's see how the volatile contents of the glasses compare to appetite from mari basalts. So what I've done is I've taken the volatile contents from Alberto Sal's study and Eric Howery's study and calculate, <coughs> excuse me, calculated the appetite that would be in equilibrium with those glasses based on the fluorine water chlorine ratio and uh, put them in the ternary along with the appetites. And you see that they kind of plot in a very similar place. The glasses are much more chlorine the, depleted than the appetite. But if we look at, um, and then if we add on top of that all the electron microprobe data, uh, of appetite for Mari basalts. They all kind of plot within the same general region, uh, although again, the glasses have much less chlorine than the appetite. If we put it into the relative volatile abundance ternary from uh, before, we see that most of them uh, plot within this region, indicating that you have more water than fluorine and more fluorine than chlorine uh, in these liquids. If we move over to the crustal rocks, again, these are the three uh, SIMS analyses from an alkali sweet class. Uh, the rest are electron microprobe analyses from both magnesium alkali sweet rocks as well as creep rich impact melts. We see that they're plotting in a different place than a lot of the Mari samples. They seem to have lower OH contents and they're uh, much higher chlorine contents. If we put them into the relative um, volatile abundance ternary, we see that a lot of them are in this region indicating higher chlorine than water or fluorine. And none of them are really plotting in this region indicating that you're dominated by water, um, except for maybe a few up here. Uh, but those are electron probe analyses, so it's, it's very hard to tell. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't trust them. We really need to get more SIMS data on, on appetite in general. So we have uh, creep basalts, which are partial melts of the lunar mantle that seem to have mixed with a significant creep component. So you know, maybe they're going to be a good uh, you know, rock to look at to see if we can really piece together two different reservoirs or if we're just looking you know, at one. So I've highlighted here where the Mare, <clears throat> where the Mare volcanic sort of plot and versus the uh, Highlands rocks. And then all these points are from uh, appetites and creep assaults, and they kind of cover both fields. So um, it's not inconsistent with the existence of two uh, distinct volatile reservoirs on the moon where one is the mantle um, and is dominated by water and the other is the crust and it's dominated by chlorine. But how would you do this? So, um, <clears throat> actually, I'm to get a drink of water. Yeah, lunar water. <laughs> oh, it's all gone. All right. So the volatile abundances of the Mare source region could either be controlled by uh, the liquid interstitial to the lunar magma ocean minerals, or it could actually be controlled by the uh, anomaly anhydrous minerals themselves. If we consider that it's sort of this liquid interstitial to the uh, cumulus grains in, in the mantle, um, we wouldn't have a mechanism by which we would fractionate uh, fluorine and hydrogen from chlorine. Um, they should sort of evolve on a similar path, uh, although not the same path as, um, you know, the lunar magma ocean liquid. 
However, if we look at the partitioning behavior of fluorine, chlorine, and OH between anomaly and hydrous minerals uh, and melt, we see that uh, pyroxene in particular prefers uh, chlorine, and, or sorry, fluorine and, and water well over chlorine. These are actually upper estimates for chlorine because uh, chlorine was below the detection limit in the silicates for pretty much um, every analysis. So this indicates that, and this process would enrich the lunar mantle in fluorine and OH relative to chlorine, and it would indicate that the lunar magma ocean pyroxene is actually controlling the volatile abundances in the Mare source. And um, so this could be the reservoir that's sampled by Mare Volcanics, and, and it's kind of giving us the, uh, the volatile signature of the lunar mantle. If we think about the petrogenesis of some of the crustal rocks, the magnesium alkali sweet rocks, uh, one mechanism is that you have these really early formed hot olivine dominated cumulates uh, rising diapirically and interacting with the anorthocytic crust with or without creep. And <clears throat> olivine at, the, at those uh, conditions, three to four GPA, uh, and, those, and the temperatures that would be likely uh, pretty much exclude all volatiles. You get very low volatile abundances in general into the, and uh, olivine under those conditions. And you would essentially have a blank slate uh, so the, the volatile abundances of those rocks would probably be dominated by the volat relative volatile abundance of the ur creep liquids, so that last kind of uh, mag motion liquid. And this is what's going to give you the uh, relative abundance of volatiles of the primordial bulk moon. So I'm arguing that you actually, the, the bulk moon, when it started, uh, probably had more chlorine than water or fluorine, and that's no longer reflected in the lunar mantle. So to conclude, uh, the volatile content of the lunar mantle seems to be dominated by water and has more water than fluorine and fluorine than chlorine. And the mantle probably reflects the partitioning behavior of fluorine, chlorine, and OH between melt and pyroxene. Uh, the crust um, and ur creep seems to be dominated by chlorine over water and fluorine. Um, and this is probably giving us an idea of the volatile abundances of the, primor <coughs> excuse me, the primordial bulk moon. And it's no longer reflected in the lunar mantle. And I've also thought a lot about the uh, chlorine isotope work being done by Zach Sharp and John Eiler's lab, as well as the hydrogen isotope stuff by Jim Greenwood, and I think we can fit it into the, <clears throat> into the model. Uh, but talk to me offline about that, because I'm out of time. So thank you. Time for one quick question for our speaker. Jack. Have you considered uh, the uh, upper and lower mantle? Uh, that is possible. Um, I, I, I try to look for everything in the sample collection, and um, I haven't seen that yet, but I'm now looking at volatile abundances among the various types of Mari basalts to see if we can tease that out. Well, you may have had two different volatile sources. Yeah. All right. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker and co-chair of the session, Brad Jolliffe will be uh, giving a talk entitled Felsic Volcanics on the Moon. Brad? Thank you. Well, I'd like to start by acknowledging uh, the co-authors and uh, the first author there will take any responsibility for erroneous interpretations. I also want to thank the LRO team and specifically the camera team. An awful lot of work goes into processing the data that we have been uh, really enjoying getting back from the moon, and especially the digital topographic data that uh, you'll see some examples of here. Top keyboard. Okay, we've known for some time that there are some interesting volcanics on the moon that are not Mare Basalt. These are the Grutheisen domes, and they're an example of uh, what we think may be a more silica-rich uh, lava form. The slopes are steeper. The viscosity of the lavas that produced these uh, was uh, much, much greater than the Mare Basalts. These are actually the largest of such domes on the moon, but there are other examples. Uh, this is what these look like in a digital topographic model. This is from the wide-angle camera uh, topography derived from the wide-angle camera images. Uh, and you can see their reds are highs. These are, these are low uh, domical features. If we look at another example, the Marin domes, and I'll show you in a minute where these are from, 
Uh, you can see uh, a couple of examples here, again, surrounded by, by Mare basalts, embayed by Mare basalts. But down here is the beautiful Marin T dome. This is a reconstruction, two times vertical exaggeration of uh, this dome right here. You can see it has a large central or summit depression. Not all of the domes uh, have this kind of a feature. Now, this is one you may not have seen before. This is from the Compton Belkovich uh, volcanic complex, which is on the far side, northern far side. Uh, of the moon. This is a beautiful uh, cumulo dome with, a, again, a, a big summit depression. That's about two to two and a half kilometers across uh, at the top. And this is, this is what we saw when we looked with the narrow angle cameras. This is an oblique view. Uh, and let me just show you where these are located. So that's the Compton Belkovich site sitting up here, far away from the others. The others are kind of concentrated in this area. What this shows are some of the sites that had been known previously spectrally as red spots. Uh, here, they're colored blue, but what this reflects is the diviner results that show directly that these have relatively silica-rich composition. So these are the sites of silicic volcanism of some sort. Now, there's another thing that these correlate to. They correlate to thorium anomalies. This shows uh, thorium from the Lunar Prospector mission. Here you see the Marin domes, the Grudheisen domes. They're not actually the high spots. The high spot here is Marin, right around Marin Crater, and here Aristarchus. Uh, crater. These clearly impacted into very thorium-rich deposits, but these, uh, indeed, without that background, uh, would show thorium enrichments, and there's been good work to, to demonstrate that. Uh, along the lower uh, part of Proslar Arm region, here's the Hanstein Alpha location. There's Kepler for comparison. Now, here's the Compton Belkovich site. So, again, located uh, very far to the north, uh, just over the uh, eastern horizon that we can't see. And you can see it has a very nice uh, thorium anomaly associated with that. And this was uh, pointed out by David Lawrence and co workers with the Lunar Prospector data uh, shortly after that mission. Now, what we didn't know at the time is what was actually causing this. When we look with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter data, we see a nice feature in here. It's a high, relatively high reflectance, and there's a little bit of a topographic feature there, and we start to see volcanic features as well. This is located on the second ring of Humboldt Ionum Basin, so there's a pretty, and, and we heard this from Grail, there's a well-fractured crust in this, in this uh, particular area. Compton Crater and Belkovich Crater here, that's how it gets its name. Now, we have to talk just briefly about the response function of the gamma ray data. It's very broad, about 200 kilometers. And what that means is that a bullseye shape of a target mapped like this, which might be mapped at 5 ppm at half degree per pixel, actually corresponds to a much higher concentration if indeed the source is this small. So for that size of a source, 40 to 50 ppm thorium is not out of line. What that tells me is that granite is involved. What we find with the lunar samples are bits and pieces of granitic materials. This is from Apollo 12 and a bunch of other samples from Apollo 12. Thorium, very high, up around 60 ppm. So this thorium signal is a clear indicator of this particular rock type. Uh, we have other uh, examples of granitic materials. This is a hand-sized sample, 12013 from Apollo 12, and it gives us a very important uh, bit of information. It's a dimic breccia, and it has, you here you can see the light-colored granitic portions, and then it has darker materials that are actually creep basalt-like, creepy materials, maybe something like basaltic andesite, if you think in those terms. And thorium between those two actually uh, behaves just as we would expect. Now back to Compton Belkovich, it may give us a good example of how these things form. It's not been embayed by Mari basalts. In fact, there are no Mari basalts uh, close to this, so we're seeing a well-preserved uh, feature. Here's the big uh, volcanic feature that I showed you earlier. Uh, NAC, I'm sorry, WAC image here showing a number of volcanic features, an interpretive cross-section here showing what I think is the case with volcanic construction on the uh, margins of this broad low dome and on the northern part, and then a central collapse feature like this, and you can see uh, some of the scarps in the interior regions here. There are also some interesting features inside this. There are small domes here. You can see one dome uh, slopes. Here it is. You can see a bunch of boulders on top of this. Another one of these domes uh, shown here. This is degraded somewhat, and as it has weathered down, it's released these uh, boulders. Tremendous. This is the boulders now that have been counted. Uh, tremendous boulder density, and that's how you can tell these things, another volcanic feature. Well, how do these things form? Here's one model for dome formation. This is after Justin Haggerty's uh, nice 2006 model 
uh, and I, I like what this signifies, is the potential, uh, you, we have a heat source that ultimately lies in the mantle, uh, producing perhaps basalts. This is a ponded uh, basalt uh, producing partial melting of a fertile crust, and I point out this has to be a fertile crust, can't easily melt in a north acidic crust. But say we have something in here that's creep rich, produces a partial melt, that partial melt then uh, uh, goes up into a, a well fractured upper crust, ponds there, further fractionates, and produces rhyolitic materials uh, at the top. So this is one idea. To take this a step further at the Compton Belkovich site, I'll give you these models. Um, again, we have a heat source that's probably something like basaltic underplating or a mantle plume causing partial melting in a, in a fertile source. That material gets uh, up into the fracture system. It doesn't have enough lithostatic pressure to get all the way to the surface, so it ponds probably at a nice boundary like a mega regolith boundary, domes up the material. We get volcanic materials on the flanks erupting, and then it finally, at a very late stage, uh, highly fractionated granitic material. So that's basically the simple model. Of course, given GRAIL results from yesterday, I have to now revisit this because these densities may be a bit too high, and if that's the case in, in the crust, that, that crust thickness may actually be about right, but we may have to revise this model. In fact, it gets, if we get densities much less than these, three for the lower crust, maybe 2.6 for the upper crust, it actually gets difficult to get this meld up, so we've got a challenge. Okay, so just to summarize things, thorium concentrations, I think, require a highly enriched source. Uh, creep basalt, melting of a creep basalt, or creep basalt, uh, creep impact melt is, is the kind of thing that's needed. We have to get this close to the surface where it can pond and then fractionate. The viscosity of the, uh, uh, the silica-rich melts is way too high to traverse the crust, so I think this has to be emplaced as a more mafic material and then fractionate. Extrusive rock types, if it's got greater than 40 parts per million thorium, I think that's reflecting a granitic or rhyolitic uh, component. In the 20 to 40 ppm region, this is something that's a little bit more in intermediate basaltic andesite-like. And examples might be the Grudheisen and Marin domes. These may not be entirely granitic materials. compton Belkovich, uh, I think, then follows this kind of a sequence. Shallow intrusion of a creep basalt-like or basaltic andesite-like feature inflates the surface. Surface fractures, maybe there's some pyroclastic dispersal, effusive eruptions along the flanks, collapse in the interior, uh, an interior caldera, and then late stage differentiates erupting as these low relief small rhyolite domes. Okay, well, let me leave you with this. With all the wonderful remote sensing we have and the beautiful sample collections, there's still some things we don't know about the moon. We should return there and investigate these unusual geologic features. Thank you. We have time for one question. Then we can down, yeah, we're going to move along because we are slightly behind schedule. And by slightly, I mean slightly. Um, our next speaker is Barbara Cohen, who's going to be giving a talk titled The Violent Early Solar System as Told by Lunar Sample Geochronology. Take away, Barbara. Thanks, Noah. Thanks to all the organizers for organizing this session and giving us a chance to talk about these things. Um, so, am I using space bar here? Uh, yeah, the top. Oh, the top people, great. Um, I don't have co-authors on this particular paper, but of course this is, uh, this is gonna review a lot of different people's work over the years, and I hope I do it some justice, but those of you who are in the room can keep me honest. Um, so, for the lunar samples themselves, the one of the, biggest lasting legacies of the Apollo samples um, is the link that they were, uh, that they allow us to forge between relative stratigraphy, which we can do on all planets with remote sensing and, um, and crater counting, and absolute age, which is um, what we can get from the Apollo samples. And the moon, of course, is the only place where we've been able to do this and to set a rel an absolute time scale um, for terrains that we can see at the surface. Um, we apply this, of course, to all the different planets um, with some varying fudge factors between the planets. Um, but if we had, uh, for example, a sample from Mars that could tie down that crater history, we could tell when the geologic processes actually took place uh, that we see reflected in the rocks. And of course, um, at the moon, we do that. I'm showing here um, a crater 
uh, crater count here versus the time, um, the radiometric age. I'm showing right now uh, just all the uh, impact craters. That's what I'm going to be focusing on in this talk today. But of course, we can do this for Mari surfaces as well. Uh, and so uh, the impact samples that we get from um, the Apollo sites could be tied by field context to specific basins. Um, there's some work that's ongoing about that, whether, uh, for example, um, the Apollo 16 uh, rocks record actually Nectaris or Imbrium. But in general, we get the Imbrium basin, we get uh, the Serenitatis Basin, possibly Nectaris. We know Oriental from relative ages. And then we get some of these younger benchmark craters like Copernicus and Tycho. Uh, and so this is the kind of um, stratigraphy that we can get. Um, this uh, crater, this axis here, the cumulative number of craters, is a function of both the elapsed time since that surface was exposed and the rate of impacts itself. So how many craters accumulate on that surface um, is a function of that flux. And that's what I want to focus on in this talk today is the impact flux itself. Um, so the lunar impact flux um, really is, uh, as I said, a function of the number of craters, but also the size of the craters and the velocity of the impacts that are making those craters. But I'm going to use as a proxy today, just as a very simple concept, the number of samples here of impact melted samples or impact affected samples as a proxy for all of those uh, wrapped into one. So uh, a very simple, simple um, concept of uh, the lunar impact flux that we've had for a long time since the moon formed. So the solar system was a very violent place early, formation of the solar system, a lot of impacts, and that sort of declines over time. This is a, a, just an example of an exponential decay. Um, and therefore, our impact melt samples or impact affected samples should mirror that kind of thing. And this is important because we, of course, as Jack said, we use the, earth to, or use the moon as a proxy for the Earth. So we really want to know what was going on in the early Earth. Um, of course, this is what we got uh, from the Apollo samples. Um, this is from Don Bogard's compilation in 1995. The impact affected samples certainly do not look like a declining flux. Uh, they look like they piled up here at, at 3.9 billion years. Uh, and this was what led to the original formulation of the lunar cataclysm, and we'll get back to that. But something that I thought was really interesting in putting this talk together is that this is from this compilation in 1995. This is what we've been doing since 1995 with Apollo samples. So as we've developed new techniques and better ways of looking at samples and new questions about what we want to be looking at, this is just since 1995 by a whole bunch of people. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, on uh, Apollo samp on uh, impact melt brushes and spherules, there's a little bit of meteorite data in there, not much glasses, uh, a whole bunch of different kinds of samples. So when you put all those together, here's sort of the record of bombardment as we understand it now, um, where this spike at 3.9 still persists, but we're filling in this area here with pre-3.9 ages. There's been a real concerted effort uh, to look for those. And then what's going on here? So these are the three things that I want to talk about today. Uh, the increased recent flux, question mark, the classic cataclysm, and what was happening before 3.9. So we'll go through those. Uh, increased recent flux, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this, but the spherules, the lunar spherules, seem to show a big increase. I'm switching the age axis back and forth to keep you on your toes. So now here's uh, present, and here's four and a half billion years reversed. And so you can see from the spherules, there's a little spike here, uh, a little about 1 billion years, and then an increased flux here, about 400 million years. Um, we don't see this as a consequence of our modeling. We think that uh, the recent flux since about 3.8 has been relatively constant, just coming from the asteroid belt. Um, but we do think that there are breakup events. We see breakup events in the L. chondrite parent body. Um, there's some evidence in um, families, dynamical families, for breakup events, for example, Baptistina. Um, and so maybe these are um, records of breakup events and not necessarily a sustained high flux. Um, but there are other ways maybe of, of increasing the number of serials. But I think that asteroid breakup events we think do happen and they are real and they can um, bring in showers of meteorites all at once. The classic cataclysm itself, that spike at 3.9, um, this is still widely debated in the community. We're still looking for evidence for and against it. The classic formulation of the cataclysm to me is uh, that many of these rocks crystallized at four and a half billion years or, or very ancient and have reset ages, especially in uranium lead. They have these discordant ages at 3.9. 
rubidium strontium argon argon, as Lars mentioned, are extra sensitive to resetting events, um, also show these sort of 3.9 to 4.0 reset uh, or disturbance ages. So the elements of the classic cataclysm to me are widespread lunar metamorphism by impact. I would say I think we have really good ages for Serenitatis, Imbrium, and Oriental that show us that there was something happening at 3.9 billion years. Three large basins is unusual compared to what we think in a uh, very calm solar system would be happening. So there's something going on there. And that would have resurfaced much of the lunar near side, particularly the Imbrium impact. Um, this was an important time in the Earth-Moon system. This is um, from Dave Kring's webpage where now here's four and a half billion years and here's today. If we have this sort of spike or this increased flux or these basins forming at 3.9, that's also around the earliest isotopic evidence for life on the Earth. Um, and uh, around the time when um, the Earth rock record becomes very, very thin and we don't have a lot of evidence of rocks before that time, and so we really turn to the moon to, to understand this time on the Earth. Um, what could have caused it? Oh. Let's see if we can, oh, hey, woo. So this, here's the news model um, uh, movie where um, here you see the orbits of the outer giant planets starting with Jupiter in red and going all the way out here. Um, and this is the Kuiper Belt or the Proto-Kuiper Belt. These kinds of icy objects are interacting with these giant planets. Uranus and Neptune are batting them back out and losing angular momentum, migrating outwards. Uh, and you'll see uh, shortly that that interaction destabilizes that icy outer belt. Um, it causes Trojan asteroids to form around Jupiter. It causes resonances to sweep through the asteroid belt. There it goes. Resonances just sweep through the asteroid belt, destabilize the main belt, clear that out to a large extent, and all those come in and hit the Earth-Moon system as well as the other planets as well. So um, this was just a huge leap forward in our understanding that these kinds of events could have happened in the solar system. These are allowable with our dynamical models. Um, and so there's been a lot of subsequent work as well um, looking at what that asteroid belt sampling um, would have looked like um, on the Earth and the Moon. Okay, what was happening before 3 billion, for 3.9 billion years? As I said, people have really been searching hard for this. Even if Imbrium were to resurface much of the near side of the moon, it really dug up material that was pre-Imbrium in nature and didn't reset everything. We should be finding things that are older, impact materials that are older than 3.9, um, but it's very difficult uh, to find. Um, there are some Apollo breaches in class with reset ages older than that. They suffer from maybe having older incorporated material or partial reset ages. It's very hard to understand some of them. Uh, and we talked about the zircon grains uh, that have overgrowth or recrystallization ages. Um, they may have been recrystallized in large impact events. They may have been recrystallized in magmatic events. It's difficult to tell what did the, that resetting or those overgrowths. Um, there are a couple of lunar melt breaches uh, that have non-argon-argon -argon ages um, that are older, especially this 4.2 age that seems to keep coming up over and over again. Um, those isotope systematics are not straightforward either, uh, and so there's some debate still going on with those. Um, personally, I tried to look at some ancient quote unquote Apollo 16 breaches, but then Katie Joy went and said that, uh, you know what, that antiquity indicator is not really as antiquity as we thought. So um, all of these things are, are showing us that it's very difficult to find evidence of uh, impacts or reset events before 3.9, but we continue to look for them. And in fact, uh, now we're seeing modeling come out. Uh, this just came out, um, Morty's uh, model about the sawtooth bombardment that um, proposes that not all impact basins formed at 3.9. In fact, the, the spike that they put here on their dynamical model allows something like 10 basins, 15 basins, basically between Nectaris and Oriental, and they propose that two-thirds of the basins formed prior to that. Uh, and so this is sort of a, a weakened model or not the strong cataclysm, and I think that's consistent with finding all of this evidence, uh, even if it's not pinned to specific basins. There are things that are happening prior to 3.9, even on the near side. Okay, so I think the, uh, what we're really seeing from these samples um, is something very different from uh, this very calm model of the solar system, solar disk forms, it all condenses, 
things go into nice uh, Keplerian orbits and that's the end of it. So it's a really a post-Apollo view of a very dynamic solar system um, and it comes about by the synergy between looking at the samples and doing these large numerical models, both of which became available just in sort of the last 15 to 20 years. Um, and so it's lucky for us that we had the Apollo samples when these things became available. Um, and I just want to close by saying um, there is some evidence or some speculation that around this extrasolar planet system that this kind of um, bombardment might be happening. We see icy dust in about a one billion year old system and that's about the right time scale. Uh, and here's the graphic that went with that story where chaos reigns and I think that is what we're trying to or what we're coming to the conclusion of in our solar system is that it's a very chaotic place. And I'll leave you with the with the words that uh, Steve, Moisich and us, Steve Moisich and I came up with um, to describe this period. It was, could have been a catastrophe with all these craters happening, could have been a catalyst by bringing in this material to the early Earth Moon system and Mars as well, Mercury of course, could have been a cauldron, just uh, an immense amount of heat being generated, um, but these hydrothermal systems may be niches for life. Um, and crucible, um, we may see impact frustration or um, necking down of the evolutionary tree um, in this, these kinds of environments. So it's an important time for us to learn about, thanks to the Apollo samples. Thanks. Thanks, Barb. <laughs> All right, we have, we have time for questions. Well, we know that there was crust there, right? So it was recording impacts. So it was, as soon as you form a crust after your magma ocean cools, you're gonna be recording impact ages. Now, whether they still exist at the surface, that is an excellent question because we know gardening, and even when you have very large impacts, they're gonna really garden that stuff really down below. So yeah, it's, that's an important point. We've been trying to model that for a little while. Okay, great. All right. yeah. Thanks, Barb. Okay. Uh, our final speaker today is Clive Neal. I learned very early in, on in life to always give and allow Clive the last word. And true to that word, yeah, well, he'll take it whether, yeah, he'll take it whether I give it to him or not. And so uh, Clive Neal will be speaking on the importance of Apollo to solar system science and future human exploration. Take away, Clive. Thank you. Well, I know by the time that I'm supposed to be finishing, so any questions? Hey, steady on back there. That's the, that's, that's the biggest applause I've had in a while. Um, so I was asked to uh, give a brief synopsis of this in uh, an informal chat with Noah. Um, and I, I put uh, Gene Cernan's quote down there, and I, I just, it's 40 years since we went, uh, we sent humans to the moon. It's 40 years since... Uh, the first uh, classically trained geologist was sent to the moon and brought samples back. And then there's been sort of 40 years of desert. Um, and it's really time, you know, if we're going to think about if, if we'd have just kept going, where would we be now? And uh, that's something, one, one thing to take away from this particular talk. But what was the importance of, of Apollo? So I've highlighted here the, the landing sites, um, there's, uh, the, where, where the different missions went. And you can see there that there's, the basic thing is it demonstrated um, that with very, and we now think crude technology, we could, we could send human, humans to another planetary surface and bring them back safely. Uh, the other thing that it also gave us is, is for the first time, uh, geologic context for return samples. Uh, that was that we got from the transcripts as Jack talked about and it allowed us then to really get a handle on what happened to our nearest neighbor in doing so if it wasn't for the moon the magma ocean concept for planetary evolution you know, probably wouldn't uh, wouldn't have occurred anytime soon 
Uh, we did have relatively extensive sample return, and, and those samples are still being worked on. There are still several samples that still haven't been opened uh, from uh, one, of, one of those is from Apollo 17. So there are still samples out there to be worked on, and there are still new discoveries to be made. And uh, as Shinichi talked about, we've got geophysics data from another planetary body. Uh, through very well, sophisticated and, and well-placed um, uh, instruments on the lunar surface. And if we just look at that, and, and you get an idea of the, what LSEP meant. And of course, Apollo 11 didn't contain an LSEP. It contained a seismometer, a uh, retroreflector, and a dust detector. Uh, but you see there in the, in the subsequent missions, it was shown that, uh, that these types of data were important. And we've learned an awful lot uh, from, those, from those data sets. And you can see there the types of instruments that were, were laid out and a couple not shown. So quite sophisticated experiments were, were constructed and a lot of data was, was actually sent back. Um, and some of those data are still being used today. Well, actually last year, you see this science paper from Rene uh, Weber uh, using the Apollo seismic, seismic data because we now have uh, computing power that is sufficient to be able to stack these different seismograms and actually start to give us a tantalizing look for the first time at the presence of a lunar core and also uh, with regards to the possibility of a liquid outer core. There are still lots of question marks with regards to, uh, to these conclusions, but it just shows you that, that we, if it wasn't for Apollo, we would have no idea um, about that and uh, with, with the Apollo data we were allowed then to put the geophysics into the sample data uh, sets and construct uh, more sophisticated uh, evolutionary models. The other, other thing about importance in, in, in future human exploration is it did show us that all right the background noise, uh, seismic background noise of the moon is, is pretty low but every now and again there was, there was quite, a, quite a big rumble and uh, if we look over here, this is a, an Apollo 16 seismogram. And if you can't see at the back, there's, there's little uh, segments down here represent 10 minutes. And this is, represents uh, what, they term, what is termed a shallow moonquake, uh, one between about 50 and 200 kilometers. And if we, if we look at these, these seismograms, you could see the maximum in, uh, motion was going on for up to 10 minutes due to the higher seismic cue as uh, Jack pointed out, uh, of, of the moon itself. And uh, Yoshio uh, Nakamura and uh, Jürgen Oberst in 1992 pointed out that this potentially uh, has a threat to any, uh, any proposed lunar outpost. And it's something that needs to be uh, looked at uh, in more detail. And, you, and you, when you actually look at these, you can see on this plot over here, that's uh, at least seven of these events, 28 recorded over the lifetime of the passive seismic network, 28 were over uh, body wave magnitude five. Um, and if you have that sort of maximum intensity and an epicenter of one of these things for 10 minutes, uh, you really don't want to crack in your habitat wall or structure and put a real crimp in your day. So the important thing here, and what Apollo showed us, just a take home message, that when you have an event, the ground shakes for a long time, much longer than we get down here on Earth. Now, also as Shinichi pointed out, the LSEP data are not all in the, the, the planetary data system. Uh, there is a NASA Lunar Science Institute focus group that's very active, Shinichi is part of that, uh, to uh, actually track down as much LSEP da data as possible. And uh, they've done a fantastic job, and you can follow their progress here, but then Dave Williams, um, has also been working on data restoration and getting those data into uh, the PDS. And you can follow the, the success of that particular effort at this, this URL here. So we, as with the samples, and we do have a lot of samples, geophysics data are also the gift to keep on giving. The trouble is that we've collected the data and we don't know where quite a bit of it is. Um, and then the other that we do have, we still need to get into a format where the broader uh, science community can actually use it. But the other important thing was the lunar samples. We've heard a lot today about the new things because analytical techniques have become more and more sophisticated. The new things and the new discoveries that are still being made on lunar samples that were brought back, uh, you know, last time, 40 years ago. 
So this is something that is uh, important to, uh, to keep in mind, and I, I really uh, hit home when uh, it was earlier this morning uh, when it was discussed, well, if we didn't have the lunar samples, would we be able to recognize lunar meteorites? So again, we keep adding to the collection because we find these lunar meteorites, but if we didn't have the lunar samples, we probably wouldn't have them at all. And uh, uh, Francis uh, McCubbin talked about this as well, about the importance of the, um, uh, these, these samples and finding volatiles both in the glasses and in the Mari basalts. So uh, what I want to end up with is, is just a brief summary of how do we use the moon to explore the solar system. And I'm going to focus, because I have very limited time, on, on something that we've been doing at Notre Dame. And that's just using textural analysis to determine impact versus pristine melts. And can we actually use that to then explore um, other, other planetary bodies? So, for example, down the bottom here, I have a number of photomicrographs, and I just, which one, which one is the impact melt? It's very difficult to tell uh, just by looking at a thin section, but if we actually undergo a detailed um, uh, textual analysis through crystal size distributions, we can start to pull that apart. Now, in most cases in the moon, we look at um, impact melts as having a, a highly siderophile element enriched impactor hitting the moon, so our impact melt contains high levels of highly siderophile elements. But this uh, requires quite a bit of sample to be destroyed in order to get those data out. Um, and if you're just trying to do a, a uh, trying to figure out what it is, this impact versus pristine melt, um, that's a lot of sample that, uh, that has to be used. So we've used a uh, quantitative approach. Two minutes. Not going to happen. There you go. Um, <laughs> so the ones in black represent the pristine melts and the ones in white down here represent the uh, impact melts. But how do we do that? So here is a crystal size distribution. Um, it's a generic one here and you can see that we've got smaller crystals down here when we've got them in different size bins. You see the s lower number of crystals in any size bin, the bigger the error bar. And then down here we get to the, uh, we get to the detection limit of the, of the actual process and we start to see a tailing off in the smaller sample sizes. So what we do in, in this method for being able to use this to determine impact from pristine is that we just use this slope here, relatively linear. When we start to get the tail off, we don't use those data. And when the error bars get sufficiently large, we don't use those data down there. So for plagioclase, we use any greater than 0.4 millimeters, and we calculate a slope and an intercept of that particular um, fraction of the CSD. And then for olivine, <clears throat> we've used less than 0.5 millimeters, and again, calculated the slope versus the intercept. So if we look at uh, plagioclase, here are the data, and this is uh, thanks to a number of grad students. And you can see here, these represent the impact melts. And you can say, well, yes, they're, they're plotting to the right of most of the data. What's the error on that? Well, it's, it's not very much, actually, when you actually go to calculate it. It's just about within the size of this symbol. And there are some of these basalts down here. This is 14053, which I'm beginning to think is an impact melt. Um, but uh, that remains to be tested. If we look at olivine, on the other hand, this is much more um, convincing in terms of where we see uh, the impact melts versus uh, the uh, pristine melts down there. So applying that to, uh, to other planetary bodies is the next stage for this. But uh, just to bring it to a close, because I'm being flashed at up here, um, you know, Apollo showed that humans could, could visit other planetary surfaces. They could be brought back safely. The science implications and the exploration implications are still being felt 40 years since the last mission to the, to the moon. Uh, we've got data sets as well as samples that are the gifts that uh, keep on giving. Um, and again, in, in terms of what we've been doing, uh, we really think that we can now start to pinpoint or differentiate just by using a thin section what is an impact melt versus a pristine melt and uh, applying that to other airless bodies is the way, uh, is the next stage of this because those other airless bodies are usually highly siderophile element enriched. Um, are they actually pristine melts or are they do, are some of these melt looking samples or meteorites that we have or, or are they uh, actually, um, are they impact melts or are they actually pristine melts? So the big question comes, when will we go back? But what Apollo has showed us is that we can use the moon to explore the solar system 
And as it's close by, it just makes sense to get back there and then use it to springboard to these other destinations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 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 I want to thank my co-conveners, Rich Bondrack and Brad Jolliffe, and particularly thank all of the speakers today. Um, poster session, 22 papers. That's right. There's uh, an extensive poster session that goes on this afternoon in the poster hall. Uh, please check them out. There's a lot of excellent posters in there that we wanted to have talks, but as you can see, we jammed as much into this session as we could. Thanks again for coming, everyone, and have a wonderful afternoon.